Hey, what's up, guys? I, I was really struggling on how to start this video just because I this might be the, the single weirdest automotive reviewing experience I've ever had. And I was trying to think if maybe there's a superlative to explain it. Like, oh, this is the this is the weirdest car I've ever tried, or this, this is the quirkiest car uh, that I've used so far, but I think it's just the worst car I've ever tested, but probably not in the ways you're expecting. So this car behind me here, this is the Fisker Ocean. You might not have heard of it. Pretty new car, pretty new company, new name anyway. Uh, and there were a lot of red flags actually going into this just the couple of days I'm spending with it got it from a Mitsubishi dealership because Fisker couldn't get one to us and then they somehow found out that we got one and they didn't want us to review this one because there's a really big software update a big 2.0 update coming to this car and I believe you Fisker but that's the thing is it's it's not really in my policy to wait on promised future software updates I'm gonna review the car that's out now that real buyers are actually living with. And then how about this? At the end, I'll tell you what their promised 2.0 software update is supposed to include. How about that? Deal? Okay, deal. So the fundamentals on paper are the Fisker Ocean. is uh, It's a midsize. It's like a crossover SUV, fully electric. And I really wanted this thing to be good. Like, I'm not just saying this. It's because it it's competitive in the same fundamentals as a lot of the most popular EVs, like Tesla Model Y, uh, Ionic 5, EV6, Mustang Mach-E, like that's that's what we're looking at here. It's an electric crossover the size of those other popular ones. It's in the forty dollars to $70,000-ish range, although this is the, the launch edition, which is like a high trim. It's the only one you can get, but it's about $75,000. But the reason it's bad is not actually the fundamentals. And I think I think a lot of people who have reviewed this car before have spent like a day with it, maybe two days with it. And I've watched a lot of those videos trying to see if they've noticed things and it's not gonna show up in a day. You, you live with this car and it slowly rears its ugly head, but the fundamentals are actually fine. Like I actually think it's a pretty handsome trim, a pretty good looking car. This is like a satin blue green paint that shows up as a slightly different color from different angles. But honestly, I think it's pretty good looking, nice looking front. This is a dual motor vehicle. It has a 360 mile range, at least claimed, and we'll get into that in a second. And it's got good materials. It's comfortable. It's got a good amount of storage. It drives pretty well. It's quiet on the inside. It's got a pretty soft suspension. It's more luxurious of a ride than a Model Y. But I'll just, let's, I'm, I'm gonna say there's a lot of really unique ideas and really unique things in this car that I've never seen in any other car. And that's exciting because I wanted that stuff to be like innovative and make its way to other cars. But if the rest of the car is bad, then it won't be seen as competition and they won't feel the need to adopt it. So I wanted the whole car to be good. Let me just, let me show you what it means. So first on the outside, pretty good looking shape, I think for a two row crossover SUV. I like the lights. It's got this nice light bar across the front here. Weirdly, it lights up and says ocean at night right there, but I like this grill. It nicely hides some of the cameras up there. There is no front trunk, but you've got this like floating Fisker logo in the middle here. It's pretty big, but good look in front of the vehicle, I think. Kind of gives me Range Rover vibes a little bit. Then you've got these huge wheels. And yes, these are aero caps. And you see these blue brake calipers. Maybe you want to show them off more. Okay, <laughs> there you go. You can take the aero caps off, get a little bit less range. And those are decent looking actual wheels underneath. But then we keep moving down the side. This is the charge port. It doesn't motorize open, but you can see the CCS port in here. No NACS on this car yet and no word of it, but it does charge pretty quick. I think it's something like 10 to 80% in 30 minutes or something like that. It's pretty competitive. It's got these nice blinkers out here on the mirror caps that I like. These retract to flush, so nice door handles. And again, the side profile, I think that's pretty solid. Kind of looks EV9-ish. A little bit of a teaser there to one of the cars we're reviewing soon. Here's the back wheels. And then here's a kind of an interesting thing. So two things. This rear window opens, we'll get to that. And this light up here, I haven't seen this in basically any other vehicle, but this high light up here is actually one of the blinkers. So if you put the lights on on the car or if you have your fog lights on, this thing lights up. Uh, it's easier to see for maybe truckers or for people higher off the ground. Uh, it's not legally necessary at all, but it also has regular blinkers down here. And then the slot tail lights, I think are pretty good too. I'm a, I'm a sucker for the bar light, so it's not quite the complete bar, but again, you've got this floating Fisker logo 
and then this rear window can also completely drop down. These are little aerodynamic bits here to help with range. And if we just zoom out a bit and get into the back, practicality matters. So you, you do have a nice looking diffuser and a pretty squat shape here, but if you actually want to get into it, there's a, I think a button right here. Yeah. And that'll show you the trunk behind some pretty spacious rear seats. That is totally accessible. Matter of fact, it's got some sub trunk space back here. So if you want to put little charging cables and stuff like that, that's cleverly hidden. It's probably the smallest you could fit a full set of golf clubs in, but it's fine. It's a good trunk. But now here's something you probably weren't expecting. The top of the car has some things you've probably never seen before. Giant Fisker logo on the, uh, it's not a spoiler, but on the back of the roof here. And then a ton of solar panels on the top. Now I've talked about solar panels on top of cars before. Uh, the Prius was a hit. I mean, people love that thing and you can get meaningful range to your drivable battery every day. So sitting out in the sun like this, Fisker claims this solar panel will get you three to six miles a day just sitting outside for free. But I am freezing my actual face off. So let's just get inside the car so I can show you the interior here. So Fisker Ocean driver's seat. And this is a pretty good start. I like this really big chunky steering wheel and it has a pretty similar layout look to the Mustang Mach-E. You've got this slot screen behind the driver steering wheel spot here and then you've got this huge portrait display over to the middle of the car. And I feel pretty comfortable saying materials and build quality are neither a highlight or a low light on this car but this is already where I'm going to get into some of the quirks to start. So like there is some plastic where you might not expect it in a $70,000 car but I'll forgive a little bit of that. Um, where do I start? Okay, HVAC controls here. I'm gonna give a thumbs up to that. Obviously there's some weird stuff still with touchscreen HVAC and you can get into that, but at least if you just want a quick temperature adjustment or a quick fan speed adjustment, you can do that with these real buttons here. Also volume of your media. These are also touchscreen buttons, but you don't have to use them. You can mostly go through these buttons here. Fine, that's good. Two wireless chargers, two cup holders, armrest, and I think these are very comfortable seats. I've been driving these a lot of miles now at this point, and I found these seats very comfortable. And that also applies to the back seat. And it's actually to the point where I would say that this is the best back seat experience of any of the EVs that it's competitive with. So I'm sitting behind a 6.3 driver's position, and I got a ton of room here. Like I usually don't have this much in a Model Y or an Ionic 5 or something. You have uh, these hideable USB type C ports right here. You have these really comfortable seats. The middle seat even has pretty good amount of foot room. And if I'm not stowing someone in the middle seat here, you've got like a nice screen back here that you can turn on your HVAC controls and pop out some tiny cup holders. Like this is all good stuff for a back seat, which also has a sunroof kinda and some coat hooks on the back and front. No pocket storage though. That's kind of weird. But I think this is where the highlights end. And I should just start telling you guys all of the weird things about this car. I think the theme here, because I'm trying to understand why they made so many of these choices. And there's a lot of weird ones. I think the theme here is it's just a young company that doesn't really know exactly what they're doing with a lot of these choices yet or hasn't considered all of the things necessary to make a great tailable car, which sounds crazy coming from me, someone who hasn't been in cars for as long as some others, but I think you'll see what I mean as soon as I get into them. So, great back seat. There are also these blocked little squares of all these, uh, these solar panels above me, but I can't tell what they're doing. Because for starters, the software in this car is very incomplete. And again, like I said, it's getting a software update soon, but I'll just show you what we're working with now, which is I have no way of knowing what's going on with the solar panels in this car. They don't tell me anything about how much range they're getting me. This is how much range I have now. 88% battery should get me 300 something miles. Cool. Uh, here's how many total miles I've driven. No indication anywhere in any software what the solar panels are doing how much energy they've generated at any point, nothing. Now here's another one. Uh, great visibility around this car. Love driving it on the highway. You can see everything everywhere around you. And as a bonus, there is a camera for this mirror back here, very adjustable. So if you have a bunch of stuff behind you, you can still use that mirror to see your rear view, cool. But they did this weird thing with these uh, sun visors where 
they're like half sun visors and they're folded out by default instead of in. And that's cool, so you can choose how much sun blockage you get, but that also means this mirror here <laughs> is pretty small. Not sure I've seen a smaller mirror on a sun visor on a car before. Now here's another one, trays, storage. They have this little armrest in the middle here, and they actually use a lot of the space with this little tray. It's like a little airplane tray where you can unfold it. It'll hold up to 11 pounds, and I guess you could put your laptop here, maybe. Or, I don't know, if you're charging, you could you could just use this as a little spot for your phone or iPad. Great, but it does take up a good amount, maybe half of that storage in there, so that's maybe it should be an option or a choice you get to make. And then on the other side, there is no glove box. There's just another tray. What? There's no, there's no glove box in this car. Just another tray for your passenger. All right. Now I mentioned that driving this car is actually fine, right? It's got a couple different drive modes, three actually. They're called Earth, Fun, and Hyper. Earth is the most chill one. Fun is a little bit sportier and Hyper is the fastest. But I have so many weird things about this. First of all, the only way to change drive modes in this car is via this unlabeled button on the steering wheel here. This one right here. There's no way in the settings to change it, and it also doesn't really tell me what's changing. But from what I've experienced, it doesn't change much. All it seems to really do is remap the throttle response. So I can't feel much of a difference at all in steering or suspension softness, but what's happening is in hyper, when you hit the gas or accelerator pedal, it just goes, which is great. It's very responsive. Fun is a little bit more rolling onto the power. Earth mode, I will floor the, the throttle and it will slowly accelerate, but then kick in the rear motor and literally spin the tires and give me the same full power. It's not nearly as elegant or, or smooth as you would expect the smoothest mode of a car to be. It's not really chill mode if you can still get full power out of earth mode. Confusing to me. Now I did find it at least kind of fun that if you were like about to make a pass that you could just quickly like pop this button a few times and you're in hyper mode and then you can make the pass and switch back to chill mode. I guess that's kind of neat, but here's another crazy thing. If you go into the settings here and you go to driving, there is a launch mode called boost and there's a 500 boost limit for the lifetime of the car. Meaning you can do the boost by turning it on here and you can come to a complete stop, brake pedal, accelerator pedal, let go. It'll do the launch control. It's quite quick, but once you do it, now there's 499 remaining for the life of the car. So I think they're trying to sort of maintain the drivetrain and not be too taxing on the motors and the battery and all that, but that is another weird thing that I've never seen in a car before, a literal digital limit to how many times you can do launch control. So, okay, here's another one. <laughs> there is a button up here to open the sunroof, and it does this pretty cool thing that I think is called California mode, which is not only does it open this sunroof, which is kind of blocked anyway, but it also lowers that rear window and is supposed to actually also drop this rear three-quarter window down, which is another thing I've never seen in a car before. But what's interesting, I'm gonna go ahead and push it real quick, is when you press it, it starts the whole sequence, it opens all of the windows, it drops the back window. Another thing I've never seen in a car before, but now that it's done, I can press it again, and it'll close everything up. All of the windows will close because again, it's freezing. I'm not sure why the rear windows in this car in particular aren't going down, but you can watch other YouTube videos where they do open. This car doesn't do it. Now here's another quirk. Like I said, there's buttons on the steering wheel for your ADAS stuff, your forward and backward songs and phone calls and volume and media control. When you're gripping the steering wheel here, unfortunately, these outside two buttons are extremely easy to press by accident because they're these big physical touch areas, which is usually the opposite of the complaint that I have of hard to press buttons, but when you're turning the steering wheel, you can actually accidentally press these buttons. This one doesn't do much if you're not in cruise control, but this one will literally restart the song you're playing. That's kind of annoying. But then of course, there's all the rest of the software in this car, which to be totally honest, is a mess. And I, I don't, first of all, I don't think I've started this car one time and not gotten some error 
on this screen behind me, whether it's just one of the steering systems or the braking systems or the cameras failing or the ADAS system not starting up, weird. You get into here, uh, there is this 360 view, the surround view that's supposed to work anytime you put the car in reverse. This has failed on me many, many times. I'll get a video of it just because it happens so often, it's easy to get a video. Um, so it's kind of annoying that I can't quite like depend on the rear view camera turning on every time I reverse. But you have the maps in the middle, you have this media control down at the bottom, and there's no quite easy way to tell this, but this screen can rotate. And I only found that out by like playing with it because I was curious about build quality and it would always snap back to vertical. The only way to know that it will turn horizontal is if you hold down again this unlabeled Fisker Ocean button for five seconds, then it will switch to horizontal and give it a couple seconds for it to figure itself out and turn horizontal. There you go. Uh, and then you have basically all the same UI stuff, but horizontal now. Again, it's on this piece of metal. If I want to switch it back, five, four, three, two, one. And there you go. <laughs> Even little things like Bluetooth, I've had an issue with in this car. The first time I drove this car home, I tried to pair my phone and I just constantly got Bluetooth pairing failed issue over and over and over again. It would try to pair and it would just show the issue on repeat over and over. So I just gave up. I just drove home in silence. Then the next day I was driving to the studio and out of nowhere, I hear a Waze alert come through the car speakers. I was like, wait, did it just start working? Oh, okay. So I just, I was like, great. I guess it paired. I started playing music. The speakers are pretty decent. Not a lot of subwoofer, not a lot of bass, but they're fine. It's a quiet car. I can hear everything. And then five minutes later, it just cuts out and the Bluetooth has disconnected again. And then it connects again. And then it disconnects again. And it's swapping my media back and forth between my phone and the car speaker. I haven't had that issue in a car in years. Now here's another thing, this screen behind the steering wheel, they've got this big UI that shows obviously your speed. And when you're accelerating and using energy from the battery, it turns red with this pulsing notification. And then when you decelerate, it turns blue. But when you're right on that middle point of the throttle where you're easing off or easing back on around that zero point between regen and acceleration, the whole screen flashes between red and blue, which can be pretty distracting, especially at night. And I've also had the driver assistance systems fail on me several times. I've had the uh, driver attention thing beep at me many times before. This car also doesn't seem to have hill hold. So brake hold is a pretty common feature in new cars where you pull up to a stoplight, depress the brake, and it will hold the car in place. It's electric, it should be able to do that. This car, you pull up to a hill, it will literally start rolling backwards if you take your foot off the brakes. It doesn't have brake hold. I found that insane. And the cherry on top is, this is the key fob here that comes with the Fisker Ocean. Um, kind of an interesting key fob. First of all, the car feels very unresponsive to proximity. I walk up to the car after it's been sitting for a while, nothing happens. It doesn't automatically unlock, it doesn't wake up, nothing happens. I press unlock, sometimes it takes me two or three times for it to actually wake up and unlock the car. That's weird. But then at least you have this button on the top of the steering wheel, or if you press and hold it, it will do the California mode thing. At least it's supposed to. That's what that button's supposed to do. Do I have to hold it for like five, six seconds? Just doesn't seem to work on mine. The list goes on and on and on. I've only had the car for a couple days, but my point here is you could give me this car and I wouldn't want to drive it. There are so many annoyances, especially with things just like the cameras and the driver assistance things beeping and blinking randomly for no reason. It just feels like the buggiest car I've ever tried. So, okay, there's an update coming with the software. What exactly does that include? Fisker is claiming that there's a couple things rolling out with a 2.0 software update. A revised torque split from 50-50 to 45-55, cool. Automatic vehicle hold, it's about time an energy meter to see how much power the solar roof is adding. Yes, please. Also, trailer sway mitigation is added to the stability control. So if you tow with this thing, that should help. Key fob enhancements to improve performance. And then the ability to install over the air updates while charging. So you can't do that yet on this car. And a reduction of state of charge loss while parked. So vampire drain while the car is sort of just sitting around. 
ideally there's a lot more that can come that's the thing about these electric cars is they're connected to the internet their computers on wheels they can improve over time mm -hmm. i feel like it's going to take a long time for this car to be acceptably usable given how many issues i've had with it but i'm rooting for it only because competition is good and the fundamentals are solid i don't get 360 miles of range but i do get 320. it's spacious it's comfortable it's good looking i'm rooting for you fisker Good luck. Thanks for watching. Catch you guys in the next one. Peace.